Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you all about collaboration. I'm also excited to see so many participants joining us. Uh, because of the high number of participants, I would like to ask that you reserve your questions for the end of the webinar, and David and I will try to leave some time at the end to answer your questions. So I see that we have a number of different fields here today. I see domestic violence advocates, attorneys, therapists, CASAs, policy analysts, family court advocates, legal advocates, and I'm really excited because we are, of course, here to talk about collaboration and how we can all work together. So I, myself, am an attorney. I graduated from law school in 2003, and I set off to change the world. I was bright-eyed, idealistic, and I didn't have any children of my own. I started working for a child advocacy program where I advocated for abused and neglected children for almost a decade. When I started my position, I was pretty sure I knew everything that there was to know about the law, because of course I was just out of law school. I was the expert on parenting, although I had no children of my own, and of course I always knew what was best for my cases, or so I thought in the beginning. Without a doubt, my heart was full of the best of intentions, but I didn't always take time to think about things from other people's perspectives, or to reach out to colleagues in other fields. There were a number of different reasons for this, from my own ego, to my perceptions of other professionals' egos, and the problem you'll be too familiar with, I had a huge caseload and simply not enough hours in the day. I'll always remember how this changed on one of my cases. It was a particularly challenging case with teenage children, domestic violence, substance abuse, mental illness, basically it had it all. And of course, nobody could agree on what to do for the family. So one day, one of the parents' attorneys actually invited all of the professionals to her office for lunch to discuss the case. She worked out of a quaint little house near downtown Reno that had been converted into an office. It still had a dining room and kitchen, and she actually cooked lunch for the entire team. We had homemade soup and cookies. It was delicious. I was there. The district attorney was there. Both of the parents' attorneys were there. There was a social worker, a CASA, a domestic violence advocate, and a school counselor. We all sat down to talk about the case, what each of our roles was, and what we each thought was best for the family. Not surprisingly, that day we agreed upon a plan that met all the needs of the family and that we all agreed upon. That day I learned what it meant to truly collaborate with other providers and that perhaps I didn't always know the right answer or solution to every case in front of me. From that day forward, I vowed to work with everybody else on the case. So what is collaboration, and why is it so important? Collaboration can take many different forms. It can be as simple as meeting with other professionals for lunch and cookies on a cold winter day like I did. It can mean communicating with other professionals, working together to meet the needs of a family, or even engaging in multi-system policy reform. Whatever form collaboration takes, it's an important and essential means of improving outcomes for the families that we work with. But why is it so important? Collaboration is important because the families that we see, much like the case that I already talked about, often involve co-occurring issues. It isn't uncommon for cases to involve child maltreatment, domestic violence, substance abuse, mental illness, and poverty-related issues. As we can see from all of the wonderful fields present, represented today, there are so many different professionals out there that are trained to address individual issues. All of us have come to our respective fields to help and to make a difference. There's no question about that. But the reality is that none of us are really trained to handle all of the different issues that these families face on our own. Nor do our workloads allow us the time, even if we were trained to do so, to address every single issue that a family faces. Oftentimes, we become so focused on our own roles that we fail to see how many other layers and challenges that there are for the families we work with. To help understand just how complex some of the cases we work on really can be, I'd like to show you a short video clip called The Story of Rachel. We are going to play a short video clip now. The audio will only play over your computer speakers, so please take a moment to mute your phone and turn up your speakers. We apologize to anyone who is only listening over the phone today, as the audio will not play over the phone. We ask for your patience while it plays. You will not hear audio for the next four minutes. In this video, 
Rachel called 911 for help and started a snowball effect. All of a sudden, Rachel's life became much more complicated. She was suddenly on her own to deal with parenting issues like dentist appointments, bills, rent, basketball practice, taxes, and was asked to sing at her church. Daryl started calling her and blaming her for the fact that he couldn't see his children, threatening her, and manipulating the children to blame Rachel for his absence. Rachel was asked to attend an interview with a DV advocate, was expected to cooperate with a CPS investigation, meet with a TANF worker, attend placement hearings and other dependency court hearings, attend divorce and custody hearings. As if this wasn't enough, Rachel's case plan additionally required her to attend a psych evaluation, parenting classes, classes, visits at the visitation center, children's counseling, individual therapy, and domestic violence classes. Not surprisingly, Rachel gets increasingly overwhelmed as the case moves forward. When you look at the whole picture, you realize that Rachel's trying her hardest to keep it together for her children. Yet from the caseworker's limited vantage point and limited understanding of domestic violence, Rachel is simply labeled uncooperative. Although we've known for years that domestic violence and child maltreatment overlap in 30 to 60 percent of cases, domestic violence and child maltreatment were historically treated as distinct issues and were handled very differently. Domestic violence advocates focused primarily on adult victims, and child welfare agencies focused on child victims, with little recognition that the two types of violence are closely linked. By taking this siloed approach, child welfare workers often failed to recognize the presence of domestic violence missed important opportunities for intervention, minimized the impact of domestic violence when it was identified, and often viewed victims of domestic violence as neg neglectful, or perhaps like Rachel, uncooperative, without fully appreciating the impossible choices they faced in keeping themselves and their children safe. In some cases, agencies went to the extreme and removed children from a home at the first sign of domestic violence, without understanding how to assess for safety and well-being in a domestic violence situation and without using the tools at their disposal for holding the perpetrator of the violence accountable for the harm. Domestic violence advocacy organizations were also ill-prepared to respond to the needs of children who had witnessed or experienced domestic violence and didn't always respond appropriately to victims as parents. For example, domestic violence advocates were trained to avoid making mandatory reports and discourage survivors from talking about the children's abuse so that they wouldn't have to make a report. Other times, advocates refused to allow adolescent boys into shelters. This required survivors to choose between keeping their families safe or together. Over the last three decades, communities and individuals from all professions began to question the wisdom of responding to these forms of violence as separate, unrelated issues. Courts, policymakers, and service providers struggled to find answers to important questions such as how can child protective services work together with domestic violence service providers to enhance the safety of multiple victims in violent homes? How can juvenile courts protect children when their mothers are being battered without re-victimizing the mother? How can communities protect battered mothers and children while still holding batterers accountable for the violence? Recognizing the importance of these questions, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges began to look for solutions. We did this in a number of important ways. First, we initiated conversations with experts from various disciplines. Next, we worked to identify programs with promising practices. We used the information that we learned to create a publication entitled Emerging Programs for Battered Mothers and Their Children. This publication highlighted 29 promising programs. We established the Resource Center on Domestic Violence, Child Protection and Custody to respond to the technical assistant needs of, assistance needs of professionals in the field. We acquired funding to develop a strategy for change to improve outcomes for families experiencing domestic violence and child maltreatment. And we convened a panel of national experts to develop re recommendations to guide policy and practice in these cases. This led to the creation of the Green Book. So what is the Green Book? In 1999, the National Council published Effective Intervention in Domestic Violence and Child Maltreatment Cases, Guidelines for Policy and Practice. Fortunately, we call it the Green Book, thanks to its green cover. The Green Book served as a guidepost for communities faced with co-occurring domestic violence and child maltreatment 
by offering principles and recommendations for how child welfare agencies, domestic violence service agencies, and the courts could work together to meet the needs of the families in front of them. The Council recognized at the outset that the project would require perspectives from different social and legal systems and convened an advisory committee that represented a diverse group of professionals, including the courts, child welfare, domestic violence services, federal agencies, and the academic community. Over several meetings spanning a period of seven months, the advisory committee met to discuss and sometimes debate draft recommendations developed by the authors, Susan Schechter and Jeffrey Edelson. The advisory committee called for the formation of task forces to develop recommendations on topics such as culture, culturally competent practice, battered mothers who abuse their children, batterer accountability, battered immigrant women, supervised visitation, and the Indian Child Welfare Act. Through more lengthy meetings and months of continuous consultations, this book took shape. The Green Book offers communities a guiding framework to develop interventions and measure progress as they seek to improve their response to families experiencing both domestic violence and child maltreatment. It is intended to present leaders of communities and institutions with a context-setting tool to develop public policy aimed at keeping families safe and stable. The book is broken into five chapters. Chapter 1 articulates an overall principle of safety, well-being, and stability for all victims of family violence and the need to hold batterers accountable for their violence. In Chapter 2, a series of principles are developed to guide communities in structuring their response to families experiencing dual forms of violence. Chapters 3, 4, and 5 focus on specific recommendations for the child protection system, the network of domestic violence service providers, and the juvenile or other trial courts with jurisdiction over child maltreatment cases. The Green Book embodies three core values, each of which seeks to encourage interventions designed to create safety, enhance well-being, and provide stability for children and families. These values include, one, keeping children in the care of the non-offending parents whenever possible by increasing victim safety and stopping the violence. Two, creating a community service system with multiple points of entry that include early intervention, cross-trained providers, and adequate resources to meet the family's needs. And three, providing appropriate responses to the diverse range of families experiencing co-occurrence. In December of 2000 and January of 2001, the U.S. Departments of Justice and Health and Human Services funded six demonstration sites under an interdepartmental demonstration initiative. They called the initiative Collaborations to Address Domestic Violence and Child Maltreatment. The demonstration required six communities to participate in the initiative and implement the Green Book's guidelines. The guidelines were directed at child welfare agencies, community-based domestic violence providers, and dependency courts. These organizations all agreed to establish collaborative structures and to develop policies and procedures to enhance the safety and well-being of battered women and their children. The six demonstration sites included El Paso County, Colorado, Grafton County, New Hampshire, Lane County, Oregon, St. Louis County, Missouri, Santa Clara County, California, and San Francisco County, California. Throughout the process, a national evaluation team reviewed the effects of implementing the Green Book recommendations and policies in these six sites. The evaluation revealed a number of important lessons about collaboration. So what are some of the lessons that the Green Book sites learned through the Green Book Initiative? I recently interviewed Lana Davis, a domestic violence survivor and the director of the Children and Youth Program at Futures Without Violence, about her experience with the Green Book Initiative. Ms. Davis worked alongside the National Council to provide technical assistance to the Green Book demonstration sites throughout the initiative. According to Ms. Davis, the most important thing that the communities learned is that collaboration is merely a strategy to achieve safer and better outcomes for families. She told me that there was so much focus on collaboration itself during the Green Book initiative that collaboration became the final destination. The Green Book sites lost track of the end goal of improving outcomes for families 
and focus too much of their effort on collaboration itself. In retrospect, retrospect Ms. Davis says that the Green Book sites learned that collaboration is an important means of improving outcomes for families and communities, but emphasized that collaboration itself should not be the final destination. The Green Book sites also learned that multi-system collaborations require a lot of structure. All of the sites ultimately adopt a shared leadership model that included at least one leader from each discipline. They also use three-tiered structures, including an executive committee to handle administrative matters, advisory committees to guide the project, and work groups to carry out the work. All of the demonstration sites also face significant challenges related to power and trust. Child welfare agencies and the courts came to the table with significant power and resources, while domestic violence providers were usually made up of grassroots organizations. The sites came up with various ways to handle their struggles around power and trust, including adding more partners to their governing bodies, facilitating retreats, and creating domestic violence consortiums. In addition, the sites learn that open and ongoing communication is essential to the success of any collaboration. They learn that they needed to communicate among themselves, as well as with victims, better prevention programs, and other professionals. Because of the nature of the professionals involved in the Green Book Initiative, issues also arose around confidentiality. Child welfare workers often expected domestic violence workers to openly share information about services or report back to them. This directly conflicted with the domestic violence service philosophy of ensuring victim confidentiality. To address this tension, the partners educated one another on their practices and expectations through cross-system trainings and work to grow their trust in one another. Not surprisingly, training was also identified by the Green Book sites as an essential component of a successful collaboration. Trainings came in a number of different forms, including community training, cross-system training, and community outreach. Cultural competency was identified as something that must be addressed in the earliest stages of forming a collaboration. Communities often found it difficult to address tough topics like racism, sexism, and classism. Communities were also ill-equipped to meet the needs of different cultures in their communities. This happened to me as well, and I worked on a number of cases where Spanish-speaking parents were ordered to attend parenting classes as part of their case plan, but none were offered in Spanish in Reno. These boilerplate requirements were not helpful and did nothing to address the unique culture of the family before the court. Communities need to have hard conversations about culture early on so they can identify these challenges before they arrive and brainstorm how to deal with them to improve services for families. One of the leading principles of the Green Book itself is that batterers should be held accountable for their actions. Of course, it was not always easy for professionals to work with men who batter, either as a result of their own fears, distrust of the batterer, or the simple fact that it's generally easier to place the burden of parenting on the victim parent. The demonstration sites found various ways to improve their practice of holding batterers accountable, using experts in fathering after violence programs, forming specialized positions for working with men who batter, creating tools for best practices, and developing safety audits. Perhaps one of the most important things that came out of the Green Book Initiative was the creation of specialized positions within child welfare agencies in the justice system. Some of the specialized positions that were developed included co-located advocates, court staff responsible for holding batterers accountable, and systems analysts. It has now been almost 10 years since the Green Book Initiative ended. In that time, communities have embraced the value of collaboration and developed new and exciting ways to increase collaboration in cases involving child protection and domestic violence. They've done this by expanding collaborations to include attorneys, better intervention programs, law enforcement, faith leaders, health centers, and other community actors. They've partnered with culturally specific organizations to help build capacity They've co-located domestic violence advocates within child welfare agencies. They've used family group conferencing and team decision making to engage the families in advancing solutions to their own challenges. And they've created specialized domestic violence units that use highly trained workers and supervisors to handle the more complicated cases. 
As you're hopefully starting to see, there are a number of exciting and important changes that communities can make to increase collaboration, depending on where your community is in the process. Before we shift our focus to how you can make these changes, I'd like to ask you to think back to the story of Rachel. Before we can begin to change our practice, we first have to engage in a huge paradigm shift. I can remember a day when I would have been frustrated with Rachel as the attorney for her children. But was she really being uncooperative, or was she overwhelmed by all of the tasks piled upon her and her own struggles to stay safe and parent her children? Would it have been easier for Rachel if the different groups had worked together so she wasn't being asked to perform the same tasks by different entities? After years of practice, I now understand how hard it is for domestic violence victims involved with the child welfare system. I also know how important it is for all of us professionals to work together to make sure that we provide the support that families need and don't simply impose our own judgments about how they should feel, act, and parent. Now that we know what collaborations can do for families and have identified some of the challenges that the Green Book sites faced, I'd like to turn the webinar over to David Mandel, the founder of the Safe and Together model for domestic violence informed child welfare practice. Now that we know where we want to go, Mr. Mandel can tell us how to get there. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, it's great to be on this webinar and joining you uh, to talk about how to shift systems to become more domestic violence informed. Um, my involvement with domestic violence work goes back to 1986, 87. I've been in the field almost 30 years at this point and actually was involved in the Green Book as a consultant for a period of time. And um, for us and for me, the creation of the Safe and Together model is, is really um, very much fits in the trajectory of um, collaboration and the spirit of the Green Book. I came into the work through the doorway of doing work with domestic violence perpetrators and so was very anchored in the survival needs and safety needs of adult domestic violence survivors and their kids. Um, when I became involved in the Green Book, it was to actually improve the response to perpetrator accountability as part of the work. Um, I became involved in working with child welfare systems around 1995-96 and been involved with those systems uh, ever since in the U.S. and a number of states in the last few years, increasingly in the um, U.K., uh, Canada, uh, and Australia, and some other countries abroad. And one of the things that I'll, I'll be honing in on is of how the Safe and Together model, with its perpetrator pattern-based approach, really moves ahead some of the, the agenda items that really were set out by the Green Book and really have been used as a tool for collaboration from the from the case level all the way up to the systems change level. So for anybody listening in, there may be things you can take away to start using in, in your cases immediately to start collaboration without elaborate systems changes and then build on that. Um, and then for those of you who are working at the systems change level, to really pull in ideas and thoughts and, and concepts that you may be able to bring into your existing collaboration efforts. Um, I really appreciated both um, Melissa referencing and showing Rachel's story and also Lana Davis's um, comment about collaboration because one of the things that we're very aware of is, is um, how the invisibility of perpetrators' behaviors and their responsibility for causing harm in families, how it's hindered collaboration. Um, in fact, what we found over the years is as, as folks have gotten together and inadvertently, child welfare has been a system that's been, that has been very focused on women, mothers particularly, and the domestic violence field has been very focused on mothers. And so when those two systems got together, without a lot of knowledge around perpetrators um, and without a lot of focus on them particularly, except for accountability, that they often came together and their continued focus, their, their collusion in some ways inadvertently was on the mother and what she should or shouldn't be doing. And some of the fights that came out of and the struggles that came out of those efforts of collaboration where people became even more intense sometimes about what they thought the mother should or shouldn't be doing and in the background, sometimes losing track of the fact that it was the perpetrator's decisions and choices that really made the difference um, and, and were really the source of the danger to children and families and to child and family functioning. And, and when we talk about a perpetrator pattern-based approach, the heart and soul of it in many ways is this idea of, does our practice and our policy reflect this idea that domestic violence perpetrators' choices and decisions are the things that are impacting child and family functioning, not the domestic violence survivor's choices and decisions. And that's a paradigm shift, and it's a movement away from domestic violence destructive 
child welfare practice um, and systems practice, which is what we saw reflected in Rachel's story, really, is a system or systems that mean well, but get involved in a way that either push somebody like Rachel further away from services or actually can increase their danger from the perpetrator. And we want to move systems that are domestic violence destructive or neglectful and shift them so they become more domestic violence informed. And the safe and together model is, 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 a, is an approach to really to, to do that. And, and when we talk about the safe and together model, it's a set of uh, model characteristic principles and critical components. It's a set of tools that are designed to improve competencies and improve cross-systems collaboration, whether it's between domestic violence advocates and child welfare, whether it's communication between CASAs and guardians ad litem and the courts, whether it's communication between all those systems and domestic violence advocates and substance use professionals, um, all with the goal of better um, assessment, better partnerships, better case plan, and obviously the ultimate outcome is, is improved safety and well-being and permanency and better outcomes for women and children and for families. Um, the model promotes collaboration in a number of different ways. It provides a common framework and language for people to share across systems and um, a way to talk to each other. And so there, there's kind of two major bits of it when we think about it. One is, are people talking about the perpetrator's pattern of behavior, their specific actions, and what they've done to impact child and family functioning? Without having that conversation or that ability, so that means in terms of um, case notes, in terms of discussion. So imagine a group of people getting together to discuss a case about domestic violence. You can start in a couple of different ways. It could, it could start with, a conversation, well, we've got this mom who's being abused and she's tried to leave six times, and uh, but she's gone back to him every single time. So that could be a, that's not an uncommon starting place for a conversation, whether within a systems or across systems. Or you could start a conversation that starts this way. We've got a case with a dad who's engaged in physical violence for his mom across a number of years, has actually kidnapped the kids, has physically harmed the kids, um, his concerns that he sexually abused the kids. Um, when mom's left, he's actually attacked her friends and her family to try to get her back. Um, when she left the state, he tracked her down. And so you can imagine now if the, the case discussion starts that way versus starting with that mom tried to leave him six times and kept going back, that the, the actual conversation may be very different because you've made visible in the conversation um, what, who the perpetrator is, what they're doing, and you can begin to tease out how they've impacted child and family functioning and even mom's decision making. So there, the model includes practical tools like perpetrator pattern mapping that helps shift the conversation away from focusing on the survivor's decision making to the perpetrators. Additionally, when we get to talking about the adult survivor, it emphasizes her strengths uh, versus her limitations as a parent. So there's, a, there's an intense focus and, and um, domestic violence advocates who are trained to use this model in their co-location work, they've really appreciated both parts of this, the ability to pivot to the perpetrator and also the ability to start talking about what mom's doing right as a parent, how she's promoting the kids functioning, how she's promoting the day-to-day -day function in the family because what we generally know is that domestic violence perpetrators are making it harder for mothers to parent, to do day-to-day -day things like get the kids up to go to school, or to get themselves to work to support the, the family. And so what we try to do in the model is really bring forward in practical ways the specific behaviors that mothers are doing to promote the safety and well-being of the children and improve family function in the face of the perpetrator's behavior. And so that kind of focus gives a, a, a very factual behavior-based fo focus for collaborative discussions across systems. And that really can shift the paradigm and move the conversation. What we find is that the, the, the approach is really grew out of both domestic violence work and child welfare work, um, really helps integrate both the goals of domestic violence advocates, those in the field and child protection, and it really kind of will let them bring together because there really is a shared desire to end the violence and, and keep the kids and the family safe. That's what you get from advocates, that's what you get from child protection, that's what you get from the family. And so when you use this framework, it really can bring the folks together. Um, we play this out in a number of different forms from specific tool levels up to projects. So, for instance, um, our Safe and Together model 
Advocacy Institute, which we're on our uh, fourth round of, um, trains domestic violence advocates who are co-located or have a heavy child welfare caseload um, to apply the Safe and Together model tools and principles in their work with child welfare or child welfare involved victims. And what we found is that advocates love the ability to have the language to shift the conversations with their child welfare partners to be more focused on the perpetrator's decision making um, through, so through a practice we call pivoting to get folks to be talking about the, what the perpetrator is doing or not doing as a parent and to really bring forward that the, the perpetrator's behavior is a parenting choice and he's just as much responsible as a parent uh, for what's going on in the household than she is and that he's 100% responsible for his violence as a parent. We've also playing this out in a recent project we're doing with New York State, which is, is a collaboration institute where we're bringing together agile welfare, training them jointly on the principles and models so they can apply it to enhance their co-location efforts. Um, we've seen it played out in joint training certified trainers in the model who are both in the domestic violence and child welfare field, using the model side by side to, chain, to train child welfare. We've also seen it applied and in case consultations with subject matter experts or specialists. And in those cases, those folks are using the critical components of the model to shift conversations to, again, bring the perpetrator's responsibility into focus and to support better partnerships with a domestic violence survivor between child welfare and, and, and the family. And, and with this, we're integrating a body of knowledge around child welfare practice and domestic violence and bringing them together. The goal of this work is to really help create domestic violence systems that are, are um, domestic violence informed and not domestic violence destructive or neglectful and not having a tremendous amount of time to go into it. just wanted you to have this idea that systems that approach domestic violence with a failure to protect framework versus a perpetrator pattern based approach are more likely to be domestic violence destructive and that systems that are better at partnering with adult survivors listening to them, asking questions, finding out what they need, identifying their strengths, validating those strengths, and building on those strengths. So a system that's domestic violence informed will be able to, a worker or system, you'll be able to sit in a meeting and someone will say, well, tell us what mom's strengths are around the kid's safety and well-being. And instead of giving the answer where, well, she keeps going back to him, somebody's going to be able to describe at the table or multiple people at the table are going to be able to describe the things that she's doing right, got the kids to the medical professionals despite his isolating the family, um, that she's still keeping the house clean, that she's taking care of the kids, feeding them, getting them off to school, meeting with the school teachers, that she's coordinating with her parents around child care, and that she's done that all despite his efforts. That's a, that's a signpost of a domestic violence informed system, and that's what we're really going for, while still having the ability to describe the risk and safety concerns the perpetrator is creating for the family. So as we work with systems through organizational assessments or training, these are the kind of things that we're trying to shift to move from domestic violence destructive to domestic violence um, competent or proficient practice. When we talk about the principles of the model and what brings people together, so when we train people, we often have people from different jurisdictions or different disciplines in the room together, and we share these same principles with them, this idea you can see the parallels here with the Green Book Project that we want people to, from the kid's perspective, agree that keeping kids safe and together with a non-offending parent, the domestic violence survivors, and those kids' best interests. So from the point of view of safety, healing from trauma, stability, and nurturance, that we talk about this as a child-centered model. And so one of the things that's really important is when you're doing cross-systems work, as Melissa mentioned, that really everybody needs to be thinking about not just what the adult survivors need, but what the child survivors need. And that people need to be able to identify what partnering looks like, the domestic violence survivor. And in our work with, with systems, we really identify some key aspects that, particularly with child welfare, that they need to be able to go in and assess the victim's strengths and understand what she's been trying to do to make things work before child welfare ever showed up. Learn from her, so partnership and practice, and build case planning jointly with her around those efforts. And those efforts need to be child-centered. And the last principle associated with the model is that, um, that we need to intervene with the perpetrator to reduce risk and harm to the child. And I, again, I want to bring people back to the Rachel story video, those of you who saw it, and that what, what was missing was any story about what happened with Calvin, the mother, um, the partner, her partner, and the, and the father of her kids, 
um, that we don't see what the system's doing to intervene with him. We don't see who's engaging him, how he's being held accountable, where the barriers are, how they're keeping a focus on behavior change, and really how we're tuning into what he needs to do differently in order to keep um, uh, the situation safer for the adult and children survivors and improve out of the families. So when we look at this, these systems, we have to really be thinking about what are the interventions being done with the perpetrators. When we also train folks around the Safe and Together model, we focus in on the critical components. And, and what I want to say to you about these five critical components is they were developed out of day-to-day -day casework with child welfare workers doing case consultation around domestic violence. So they're practice-based. They come out of uh, hundreds and hundreds of conversations with child welfare workers who are really trying to address the issue of domestic violence. And what we found out of those conversations is that the workers were often making huge decisions about the family without knowing the basics of the perpetrator's pattern of behavior. And so what you see here is, is these five boxes that need to be filled in as a starting point in order to make good decisions in case practice. So if you're part of a collaboration or your supervisor in a case, and your worker can't describe to you what the perpetrator's pattern of course control is, or actions taken to harm the kids, and all they can say is the number of charges he's had, or how many open cases there have, then probably their, their own safety assessment for the workers, or for themselves as a worker, is not going to be as good as it could be. And that also their, probably their risk and safety assessment is likely to be lacking in terms of what the perpetrator has done to the family. And that it's much more likely without making the perpetrator's behaviors visible through a discussion of what they are, that the focus is more likely going to be on the victim's decision making. And so when we really talk about day-to-day -day practical collaboration, what we've seen is these critical components used to help guide multidisciplinary fatality reviews. We've seen it being used to, to guide multidisciplinary case reviews for people sitting down and discussing cases. So giving them a structure. So if you're looking for a collaborative tool, you could take these five critical components and say, we're going to run our meetings. We're going to start our meetings by filling in each of these five boxes about what we know about the case and using it to map the case. And if you want to do as an experiment, try this out and see how it shifts your conversations. It'll help you identify where the gaps are in information. It'll help you um, identify where the victim's strengths are. They'll help you describe the impact on, on the perpetrators, on a perpetrator on the kids, and then the role of intersecting issues like mental health and substance use. Um, it'll help bring forward cultural issues. And one of the things that we're most proud about in terms of this model is that its behavioral focus can help mitigate issues of bias around race and class and ethnicity, because what it does is it gives people a behaviorally based tool to really discuss what's happening to the family because of the perpetrator's behavior. So less dependent on stereotypes, on biases, it really lets us get down to what did this person do that we're concerned about and what they do to child and family functioning. So as we kind of, I'll move through a couple more of the key bits of the model is that um, a foundational value in the model, it's that the perpetrator's behavior that is the, the source of the risk and safety concerns for the kids not the um, domestic violence survivor's behavior, unless she's actually being physically abusive or doing something else to the kids. And this is really critical because this shifts conversations across systems because it allows advocates to talk about that, yes, we're concerned about the safety of the kids, but let's talk about who's making the decision-making that's creating the concerns. If mom's going back to him over and over again, um, two things are really important. We wouldn't be worried about that if we didn't think he was dangerous. So what exactly is he doing? Because then the source of the danger is him. And second is if you don't know what he's doing, the actual behaviors, you actually can't tell if her going back to him is actually him coercing her to go back or actually her trying to protect the kids and herself by going back and, in fact, trying to make things as safe as possible. So without actually seeing his behavior as the source of the problem around domestic violence and kids, then we're often making poor decisions. And this is where language can really matter because in domestic violence, destructive or neglectful systems, we often talk about the family has a history of domestic violence or is engaged in domestic violence. In the domestic violence informed system, we actually describe things like the father has engaged in a history of violence to mom and the kids and then describe the specific behaviors and then go from there to describe what the impact has been on child and family functioning of his behaviors. So it no longer becomes the couple has a history, but now we're describing his behaviors. 
And so you get this really clear picture. And instead of being domestic violence, it's the perpetrator's behavior impacting child and the family functioning. So again, from a collaborative point of view, this behavior-based focus and this focus on the perpetrator's behavior really helps close the gap between domestic violence advocates and child welfare that's been historically there. One of um, the things that we experience is that the model travels well overseas. And so when I did a training on this approach in Queensland, Australia, about four years ago, with a group of about 150 child welfare workers and domestic violence advocates split 50-50, that at the end of the day, after one day of training on this, that somebody who, who really knew the community really well said, we've been trying to have this conversation for 10 years. And we haven't been able to have it until you brought in the perpetrator pattern-based approach that allowed these folks to come in together. And in fact, we worked some cases together where it really brought together both advocates and child welfare to really agree on a solution or, or, or a step forward. So when we look at what a perpetrator pattern-based approach does, is it shifts the focus onto the perpetrator's pattern, not on relationship status or the survivor's behavior or even where people are living. So oftentimes people will say, oh, he's out of the house now, there's no domestic violence, child welfare concerns. And that may not be true. And so when we look at this, it means looking at the perpetrator's behavior in this relationship, in other relationships, at, uh, outside the home. And in this way, you can think about it as much, very similar to the way we do assessments around sex offending. It's not the relationship that we're looking at. We're not looking at what people are living. We're looking at, does this person represent a risk to kids? in this home, in the school, in the community. And similarly, a perpetrator pattern-based approach to the issue of domestic violence to kids requires us to think about what did he do to his, his, the mother of his last girlfriend, uh, his last set of kids. And so when we look at that, those things, what becomes clear is that we have somebody who may be a serial abuser across relationships and also is physically abusing kids as well, abusing the adult partner. So these kind of things really kind of help um, shift the focus in a very practical way. So again, if you want to bring a collaborative tool out of this webinar to one of your meetings or practices, start asking more questions about what the perpetrator's behavior pattern is across relationships and do less focusing on the relationship status. If, if the relationship ends, you've got to ask yourself, why do we believe the kids are safe visiting with him? What do we know about his behaviors, that he's treated, how he's treated the kids or, or uh, impact to the kids, how is he taking responsibility for how he's treated the kids or interfered with the mother-child relationship. This model is not only useful for child welfare cases, but also family court cases because it really helps close the gap that often presents itself um, when people act like, oh, he didn't hurt the kids, so um, he can have full access and custody without any assessment of his dangerousness. Um, in this way, it brings a strong nexus between the perpetrator's behavior um, to child safety and well-being. And it really uh, brings forward this idea that perpetrator's behavior is a parenting choice, whether the kids see it or not. Um, it's reasonable to expect a parent to know that if he, he hurts his kid's mother, that that's going to be a negative influence on his kids, whether his kids see it or not. And that's something that we can really expect from perpetrators as parents when we engage them. So this just gives, gives you a couple of different ways to think about it. I'm going to move to wrapping up. But we often frame the questions around of collaboration, what are the negative effects of the domestic violence perpetrator's behavior on child and family functioning? So again, this is different than asking, how have the kids been impacted by the domestic violence? So I really want you to see that by putting the perpetrator's behavior pattern front and center, that we really can shift the conversations across systems. And then when we have a wider understanding of the pathways to harm, that domestic violence perpetrators can affect family functioning and harm to kids in, in multiple ways, children's trauma and safety, effects on family ecology like loss of income, housing instability, we begin to make the perpetrator responsible instead of saying in the notes, mother was unable to maintain stable housing for herself and her kids, you begin by describing or start describing how the perpetrator got them evicted through his violence, tracked her down at the, at the housing situation, got her kicked out of the housing because he got violent with her moved her across the county or across the country. And so when you start pointing to effects on family ecology, if you don't really know um, what the perpetrator did and what the pathways to harm are, then you're much more likely to blame the victim for what's going on, and that's going to make it harder for collaboration. And then the question we need to be able to answer is, what are we doing to intervene with him to improve child and family functioning? How are we addressing him in a way that expects to improve safety, help, um, the family heal from the trauma, 
and stability and nurturing. So when we bring these into the equation, you start asking questions about how is he helping the kids heal from the trauma? If he's having contact, that sets real high standards from him. If, if he's got a responsibility for the kids, then what is he doing to promote stability and nurturance, even if he's not in the home? That may mean pay, paying rent for the, for the house. And these are basic needs arguments, not custody, access, child support. Because when we look through a child welfare point of view, that if you've got a parent who's not in the home, they're still just as responsible for kids' basic needs being met. So you begin to craft your interventions in a really broad and expansive, from a broad and expansive set of expectations. And then when we look at improving collaboration, we can ask the question, what is the domestic abuse survivor doing to promote child and family functioning in response to or in the context of the domestic abuse perpetrator's pattern of behavior? And we start identifying a much wider range of strengths. Um, and it's not just did she get a restraining order or order of protection to leave the house, but, but really we should be able to identify how she's managing the household to reduce the kid's exposure to violence. These are just some examples. Send the kids away, intervening to protect the kids, getting orders of protection, talking to the children, bringing them to counseling, providing normalcy, engaging relatives in the lives of the kids, making sure household continues to function. When we start broadening out our, our assessment lens for the adult survivor, you really begin to get a much bigger sense of how hard victims are working in almost all these situations to keep kids safe, to promote their well-being, to provide stability and nurturance. Any collaborative effort has to put this strength-based perspective front and center. And then how do we have to ask ourselves? And so again, if you're looking at your collaborative meetings, somebody could just simply say at the next collaborative meeting in your area, what are we doing to partner with our to support and strengthen our ability to act in ways that are supportive of child and family functioning? So how are we actually helping her do the things she's already trying to do and get the kids to school, make sure the family's financially stable, support housing, and how do we do in a way that fits her cultural values, her socioeconomic status, and meet, helps meet her other needs? Uh, this is a really quick presentation. For those of you who want more resources, they can go to our website or our YouTube channel. Uh, people find a lot of videos there that are really um, um, very beneficial to them. So you go to youtube.com, Safing Together Model. Um, we will be um, providing online courses by the fall of this year. So you can go to our website and join up for a member to get our newsletter that comes out every couple of weeks. Um, and then for those of you who love traveling to Orlando, we have our Safing Together Symposium in the fall in October. Last year we had 170 people from 20 states come, and we'd encourage people to, to check out the website and see if they want to come to that. And the last thing I can say, Melissa, is just letting people know that in the spirit of collaboration that we're going to be um, launching the Safe and Together Institute in a couple of weeks, actually, which is a, a vehicle for really promoting um, collaboration and evaluation and work cross systems. So I encourage people, again, to check out what we'll be doing. So, Melissa, I think I'll stop at that point and see if we've got any questions and comments. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Um, and before we go to the comments and questions, I'd also just like to ask all of you to take a look at the web links on the right side of your screen. We've got some helpful links there to the Resource Center website where you can find the Green Book itself, resources on the Green Book. Um, our Synergy issue, which is our newsletter, our last issue was actually um, focused on collaboration um, and in, it includes the full interview of Lana Davis and an interview of Joe Simonson and some really important information. And you can also ask for technical assistance through that website. Um, you also have the Green Book website. You have links to Ohio, New Jersey, and New York, which all have really good programs on co-located advocates. And you have a link to a training tool through Futures Without Violence on family group conferencing and team decision making. So I'd ask you to take a look at all of those. Um, we're also having a summer webinar series that we're about halfway through, and you're probably already aware of it since you're on this webinar. Um, but take a look at our website. We have a number of really good webinars coming up. Um, we still have some really relevant ones to folks that are on the call today. So I, it looks like Wendy asked a good question. Um, how do you keep offenders, friends, and family from harassing the victim? Uh, and John gave a really good answer to that. You know, if they are directly harassing the victim, then she can certainly seek a protective order against them. And if the offender is communicating through them with the victim, then the offender is likely violating the protective order. So those are um, 
I'd say take a look at his answer. He gave a really good thorough one. And then, David, it looks like there's a question for you from Deborah Wingfield asking, how do you make visible the coercive control behaviors of the perpetrator when there's no evidence of physical abuse toward the safe parent? I think by, by asking questions about what those specific behaviors of concern are, whether they're physical, whether they're emotional, and then be able to describe what their impact has been on child and family functioning. Domestic violence is a behavior-based issue. It's defined by behaviors. And so the conversation um, needs to go around what did he do and what was its impact? And so what did he say? What did he do? How did he act? What kind of choices did he make? And how did it affect day-to-day -day functioning of the family? And I think sometimes um, we all can be frustrated um, because we can't always make those things visible, but that's the process over and over again. And, and it's, it's different than saying she's isolated or the kids have been harmed by his behavior. You actually have to ask the question, what did he do to hurt the kids? What did, what did he say? How did he act? Um, and in making those things visible and be able to make the connection specifically, what did that do to the family? Um, um, did it make it harder for them to go to school? Did it make it harder for the mother and kids to relate to one another? Did it cause um, um, emotional trauma? You know, you can go through different things and really ask those questions. So it's, we should be able to make these things visible or more visible by using a perpetrator pattern-based approach. And I'd just like to add to that. I think that part of the challenge there is the paradigm shift that we talked about. Um, educating other professionals, the court, social workers, folks that may not be really familiar with the, the dynamics of domestic violence, that domestic violence is a pattern of coercion and control, that it isn't just physical abuse, which many people still believe that that is the definition of domestic violence. So educating yourself, learning more about what domestic violence really is and what the real concerns are, um, and talking to other professionals. That's where collaboration comes in. Domestic violence advocates know this stuff. They're able to educate. And so if we, you know, certainly myself as a child advocate attorney, if I didn't bring them into the conversation, I was missing something. And I was, um, I was missing a lot, actually. And so I think that's sort of the point today is that we all need to educate ourselves and we need to talk. We all need to educate ourselves and we need to talk. And Melissa, it's, you know, um it's going back to the earlier question about sort of the relatives, I mean, I think that's very important in the child welfare setting that we do a perpetrator pattern-based approach. You actually ask questions about how has he used extended family, kin, friends as part of his pattern of controlling her, and are they safe placement resources? I mean, sometimes child welfare is often looking to paternal relatives to keep kids in the community, um, and that's a particularly, that's an overall important goal, but a perpetrator pattern-based approach not only looks at his physical violence, but actually the involvement of his family and other folks. And that can be very germane to any decision making the court may make around custody access, but particularly placement of kids in child welfare cases. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chat box here, and John, John, I'm guessing you're probably an attorney. Um, I, I agree, all of these things are are problematic in the context of, of a courtroom where you have to overcome the evidentiary rules and you have problems with hearsay. Um, and, and I think that it is more difficult in custody evaluations in family court cases um, where you're not necessarily able to resolve some of this outside of the courtroom in family case planning meetings. Um, but you can, you do, you have to be creative and you have to find ways to get this information in and it is possible to get it in and still comply with evidentiary rules. Um, and it's so important. And, and in my experience, as you're getting the information and you're educating the judges, who sometimes don't know this either. Um, and so part of your job as an attorney or as a CASA or whoever it is that's presenting to the court is to find a way to make sure that the judges know what domestic violence is, know how the coercion and control affects the victim and the children, and, and find creative ways to get that information in front of the court. And Melissa, I think, you know, it, it's going back to your point that a lot of this information is available already in the public domain, whether it's, it's, it's arrests and convictions with other partners, 
whether it's part of other child welfare cases that can be used in terms of court cases. Again, in every system has different different standards of evidence and every, every different focus um, areas of focus. But in, in terms of this, there's often very low hanging fruit when you start looking for a perpetrator pattern based approach that really can be um, uh, part of an assessment, um, a social study in child welfare, or it can be part of a different piece of work or a custody evaluator. Or there's different things. Not everything is about evidentiary levels, but sometimes it's just there and available for everybody to see that this person has been abusive to multiple partners. Um, that can be very important. And Mindy, thank you for your comment. I, I, I um, agree that oftentimes CPS doesn't want to get involved um, when there's a pending custody case. And the resource center, our resource center here at the council is on domestic violence as it relates to child protection, but also domestic violence and custody cases. So I would encourage you to take a look at our website. We do have a lot of resources on domestic violence and custody, um, custody evaluations, and I would I would certainly suggest that you take a look at that. And if the information you need isn't there, you can request technical assistance from the resource center on specific questions and issues. From the resource center on specific questions and issues. And, so and it, it is now 11 o'clock. We're going to go ahead yeah. and wrap up the yeah. webinar. Okay. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. We are going to show the Rachel video one more time at this point for those who missed it. We unfortunately do not have authority to include the Rachel video when we post the website. So we're going to show it now and 